Hello nation and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Commander Cheapskate Game Reviews. And this is the series where we review various products related to the miniature wargaming hobby. And on today's episode, we are continuing on with our analysis and review of the Warhammer Armies Project. Now, in case you're unfamiliar with it, the Warhammer Armies Project is a series of rule books that was written by Matthias Eliason. He basically created a blogger site where he's been making 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy rules, uh, not just for the core game but for every single army within that system as well as for some different factions that don't have rule books or not supported by Games Workshop in an official capacity. So armies like Albion for example, the Kingdom of End as well as Cathay are just some of the different factions that he has written rule books for in his 9th edition uh, set of rules. So in today's episode we're going to take a look at the 9th edition rules for Warhammer Beastmen. So this is the Beastmen army book. During this review we'll be doing things like looking at the different army rules and the different units within it. We'll also be doing analysis of the special characters that are also available in this document as well as magic and magic items and finally we'll also talk about the army list as well. In addition we will also give our overall impression of the uh, entire document as a whole. Now this document is available free to download as a PDF from the Warhammer Armies project and in no way are these rules official in any capacity. However, if you are looking for a new way to play Beastmen especially with the current updated rule set, this is a pretty good resource to take a look at. So that being said, let's get this video report on a roll. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this document roll fast. So as we scroll through, let me go and zoom out a little bit so you guys can see it better. As you can see, as we scroll through it, uh, this is a beautifully designed PDF, as you can see there. It's got borders and some beautiful graphic design on it, and some really excellent desktop publishing went into creating this document as well. In fact, if you didn't know any better, you could assume that this was actually an official document. That's how high quality this uh, layout really is. So now that we got the information down for the overall impressions, what we're going to do is we're going to click on the uh, army rules real quick on page 64. So let me go and just get there real quick. Alright, so we're going to go over the rules real fast. So starting off with the army special rules, we have an addition to Primal Fury. So Primal Fury has been around since Warhammer, ooh, I think 6th edition is when this book was originally, uh, when the rules came out for Beastmen by themselves. So with this new addition, we have a brand new additions to Primal Fury. It says, at the beginning of each round of close combat, each engaged unit with a Primal Fury special rule must take a leadership test. If the test is passed, that unit gains the Hatred special rule until the end of the close combat phase. So that, of course, has remained unchanged. However, here's where the update comes in. In addition, if they pass a leadership test and rolled a double, they also gain the Frenzy special rule until the end of the close combat phase. Originally, if I remember correctly, you had to roll Snake Eyes in order for you to get that Frenzy special rule added to your Primal Fury, but now it's just any doubles of whatsoever. So that's also available too. Then we also have an update to the Beastman Ambush. It says models with this rule have the Ambusher special rule, though this is lost if they have any kind of mount. In addition, they add plus one to any rules to determine whether or not they enter the table when using the Ambusher special rule. Note that your army general must deploy normally. So, as you can see there, we do have the Ambushing rule for the Beastman for the most part. At the same time, there's also been a huge update to that. If I remember correctly, in the original 6th edition rules, uh, what ended up happening is that you can only have an ambushing unit if you had another an unit that wasn't ambushing, if I remember correctly. So they've taken that away. So now you just have this new rule update as well. We also have a new uh, rule come alt called uh, Unruly. It says all models of this special rule follow the Berserk Rage rules for Frenzy. In addition, if they are forced to charge as a result of a failed Berserk Rage test, they may reroll failed charge distance results. So because of that, we do have that discipline modifier coming in for the game, which is kind of uh, which is kind of expected and evocative of Beastmen. Beastmen are supposed to be these unruly kind of bestial creatures, so this rule kind of fits them pretty well. Kind of like how Animosity does for Orcs and Goblins. Now another huge update that we see now is that Beastmen automatically get Marks of Chaos now. That was not originally available for Beastmen. In fact, I think that game mechanic did not come into effect until the end time special rules for uh, Warhammer Fantasy. So now, of course, we have our uh, Marks of Chaos. And the only stipulation that you have here, of course, is that both your um, it says your Giddy Characters Regiments, the Beastmen Army, have or can purchase one of the four Marks of Chaos detailed below. A character with a Mark of Chaos cannot join a unit that has a different Mark of Chaos. A character with a Mark of Chaos cannot join a unit that has already been joined by a character that has a different Mark. So we have that as well. So let's go and talk about those Marks real quick. So Mark of Corn, we have the unit subject to Frenzy. That's always been a, you know, gold standard for, uh, for the Mark of Corn. 
For Mark or Nurgle, it says models this mark add plus one to their toughness characteristics, but suffer minus two to their initiative to a minimum of one. So that's back now. So instead of having to worry about minus one hit against, we now have a modifier for toughness with an equal modifier to your initiative value characteristic. Models with Marcus Slanesh gain the immunity to psychology and stubborn special rules, which is actually kind of nice because uh, Beastmen have notoriously bad leadership characteristics. And then we have Marcus Nietzsche. Uh, models with the Marcus Nietzsche have the Magic Resistance 1 and Ward Save a 6 up special rules as well. So now we can include magic, uh, Chaos Marks within our monsters as well, so that's excellent. So Beast Lords, so let's go ahead and talk about our individual units now. <clears throat> so as you can see, the stats are relatively stay the same. The only difference now is that we have four Strider now being added to this unit as well, which always made sense to me. And the reason why is because Beastmen, you know, traditionally live in the forests of the old world. That's their bread and butter, that's their home, that's where they feel safe. So it makes sense to give them four Strider. I don't believe that was available in the previous rule sets for Beastmen, so it's kind of nice that they've included that as well. And then of course we have the uh, Bray Shamans, which are your magic casters. Uh, magic casters with strength of 4, toughness of 5, so these are also combat casters, which are actually kind of neat. And it looks like the lores they can use now are the Lore of Beasts, Lore of Shadow, Lore of Death, or the Lore of the Wild. So the Lore of the Wild does make a return in this edition of the rules. And of course if you take a Chaos Mark, um, Lore of Nietzsche, Lore of Nurgle, and Lore of Slash respectively, uh, depending on who you, you know, what lore you decide to take for your marks. So it looks like that is a brand new edition as well. Then we have our Gores, as you can see here, they're pretty much exactly the same stats as before, so not much change there. Same thing with our best of Gores, uh, the Despoiler rule still adds plus one to their future combat reses for each standard they capture, so that part is pretty cool as well. And also they have the Devastating Charge rule now, I don't think that was originally part of their um, setup originally, but now they have that as part of their special rules. Also there's major changes for their equipment for this unit as well, but we will talk about that when we get to the army lists. We'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Then, of course, we have our Orngors, our flackable uh, guys you get just, you know, are lesser than um, Beastmen, as you see there. They still got their similar stats to a normal human being, as well as uh, the Unruly trait for them. And we, of course, have our Orngor Raiders, which are our chaff units, as well as our ambushing skirmishers. These guys are back as well, so that part is pretty cool, too. Now, we have a brand new unit now that's unique to this army, which is called Mutants. So let's go on and talk about those guys real quick. So for their stats, for a basic mutant, it's pretty much the same as a normal humans. The difference, though, is that instead of leadership 7, they have leadership of 6. So they do have that reduction in their leadership value. They do have the expendable special rule, so they don't cause any panic if they get destroyed. But they also got this new rule called Chaos Mutations. It reads, roll a d6 at the start of the game to determine which mutation is the most prominent for the remainder of the game. And as you can see, we have six different results. We have Animalistic Legs, to give them plus one movement. We have Hulking, which gives them plus one strength. Grossly Fat, which gives them plus one toughness. Scales, which gives them a six of natural armor save. Tentacle-like Arms, which gives them plus one attack. And Piercing Hand, which gives them an armor piercing one special rule. So it's actually kind of cool because it looks like it's all benefits for this mutation table and no negative effects whatsoever. So it's actually kind of cool there as well. And of course, if you want to just have some expendable, you know, fighting units with some buffs, I can see these guys being really dangerous, especially if they get plus one strength or plus one toughness. That would actually be kind of cool. All right, so then of course we have our Chaos Warhounds. Chaos Warhounds automatically get Vanguard on this one as well. And of course we use these guys for our chaff as always. And then of course we have the Dreaded Minotaur units. Minotaurs make a comeback on this one as well. I believe the only major difference between the previous edition to now is that they have this impact hit special rule as well. And of course we have our Blood Greed. If a model with Blood Greed is on the winning side in a round of close combat and immediately gains the Frenzy special rule. If it is already frenzied, then each time it is on the winning side of a round of close combat, the model gains plus one attack up to a maximum of plus three. These bonus attacks are lost if the model loses its frenzy. However, models with Burgery cannot use their Swift Stride rule when pursuing and overrunning. So we have a little bit of an adjust adjustment there to the Blood Greed rule as well, which is really dangerous for uh, any opponents because Minotaurs, as we know, can really bring the pain in close combat, and this really just kind of helps them out and be able to do that. And of course, we have the return of the Doom Bulls, of course. Those are the absolute terrifying, you know, Minotaurs on steroids. Uh, they cause D3 impact hits now, and they also have their Blood Grease special rule as well. And it looks like any unit accompanied by a Frenzy Doom Bull or Gold Bull is also subject to Frenzy as well. So once again, we do have those stats for those guys. Makes them extremely deadly as well. Then of course we have the return of the Tuscord Chariot, which has always been a fan favorite with an armor, natural armor save of 6 up and Primal Fury. So those guys make a return. We also have our Razor Gores. They're back as well. Looks like they have the Impact D3 hits. 
Strength 5, Toughness 5, 3 wounds, two, uh, 3 attacks. Looks like they get a Strength bonus for charging as well, as well as our Razor Guard Chariots. Those have also made back as well, and they also cause Fear now. And they also have the Thunderous Charge ability for uh, the Razor Gore. And of course we have our lovely Centigores. These guys are back once again. Uh, these are our Cavalry choices for the most part. Um, they've also actually changed up the Drunken Rule a little bit, so let's go and talk about that real fast. So it says, roll a d6 for each Centigore unit at the beginning of each of their turns and consult the table below to see the effects of their rampant alcoholism until the start of their next turn. So on a 1 to 2, they have Stupidity, on a 3 through 4, they have Frenzy, and on a 5 through 6, they have Stubborn. So it looks like they adjusted their rules a little bit for uh, the Centigores, which is actually pretty neat. All right, so then we also have Harpies now. Harpies are now available for Beastman units as well, which is really great because Flying Chaff is just all kinds of awesome, especially if you use them as War Machine Hunters. We also have Chaos Trolls now. I don't believe they could take Chaos Trolls in the original editions of the game, so now they can do that now. So that's one of the things that they have as well. Natural Armor of 6 up for our region. They have their Stupidity Attack as well as their Troll Vomit, so those are all still aspects of the game that they can still use. So that part's pretty neat. We also have Chaos Spawn, of course, and we have a little bit of addition change for the Chaos Spawn rules in terms of their upgrades for their marks. So as you can see here, they still have uh, random movement, random attacks, but if you give them a spawn of Nurgle, they get the Poison Attack Special Rule. For spawns of Slanesh, they gain a plus two to the initiative. For spawn of Corn, they earn plus one strength, and then for spawn of Tzich, they earn a strength three breath attack. So that's actually pretty cool there. So if you want to look for some new ways in order to add some Chaos Spawn, That'd be one way to do that. So moving on, we have the Praetan. So now we actually have some new units added to this army list as well. These are actually from the Forge Rule um, series of rules for some different monsters. So the Praetan here, in case you don't know, it's kind of like a stag dragon monster thing. Uh, it's got movement 6, 4 weapon skill, 5 strength, 4 toughness, 3 wounds, 5 initiative, 3 attacks, as well as 6 leadership. It's a monstrous beast. It's got the fly, 4 strider, and impact hits d3 special rule. We have this rule called consuming hatred. A Praetan has the hatred special rule, and any wounds it suffers during close combat are included in its player's own combat result score, as well as their opponents. So that's actually kind of neat. So even though if you might take damage, it still adds to your combat res. So it's actually kind of interesting, because... As the rule says here, the Praetan despises itself almost as much as its foe. So, full of pain on that one. Then we also have what's called Endless Malice. Should a Praetan be on the winning side of a close combat, then in order to pursue its foe, it must first pass a leadership test. If this test is failed, then it will not pursue and instead remain stationary whilst it runs and tears at the fallen. Enemy is within 12 inches and within line of sight of the Praetan must take a panic test in the face of the beast's horrific display. So there's that rule as well, which is actually kind of interesting too. Now for upgrades, you can get what's called Insane Bloodlust, which means the Praetan gains Frenzy. You can also get Forest Stalker. The Praetan gains the Ambusher Special Rule, which would be really cool if you want to cause some back rank mayhem. And then we have Filth Encrusted Scales. The Praetan gains the Natural Armor 5 up armor save. So very, very cool for that one. And of course, we also have the Cockatrice as well. It also makes an appearance in this army. It's got pretty mediocre stats. Four movement, four weapon skill, five ballistic skill, four strength and toughness, three wounds, six initiative, four attacks, and six leadership. However, this thing can fly. It's got a natural armor save of four up. And the main reason why you get this creature is for the petrifying gaze. As a magical shooting attack with a falling profile, it's got a 12-inch range, strength four. It has heroic killing blow, ignores armor save, magic attacks, multiple shots too. Hits from the Petrifying glaze, uh, Gaze only work against units with line of sight to the Cockatrice. When rolling to wound with its shooting attack, substitute the target's toughness with its initiative value. So absolutely terrifying. This thing can actually be really cool about in order to, you know, kill some pretty powerful opponents if you're pretty lucky just by rolling up a six. So that's actually kind of cool there too. And it looks like the army can now take Dragon Ogres as well. So Dragon Ogres make a return and this time they can also be included in Beastman Armies, which is really cool. Uh, as you can see, they got some pretty good stats, as well as immunity to lightning attacks, as well as a 5-up natural armor save. And you can also take Dragon Ogre Shagoths as well. These could actually be part of the army too, with immunity to lightning attacks, as well as psychology and natural armor 5-up. Awesome stats as always, so now you can take these guys within your armies of beastmen. Which is actually kind of cool, because like, you know, it kind of goes in that, that idea that these mutants and monsters all kind of come together to make their beastmen army, so it's kind of cool. Gorgons are back once again. As you can see here, we have their similar stats from last time. They have the Blood Greed, Frenzy, Immunity Psychology, and Stubborn Special Rules. 
Uh, looks like the Swallow Ho and Strength from Flesh rules are still applying to these guys, so that part is really cool. And of course we have our Saigors, they make a return as well. The Saigor has really good strength, toughness, and wounds, but horrific weapon skill and ballistic skill. But that's not the reason why you take this thing. The reason why you take this thing, of course, is because you want to do the Soul Eater. Enemy enemies within 24 inches of one or more Saigors must take a leadership test at the beginning of the magic phase. If the test is failed, the wizard's loss his nerve and any spells he wishes to reach the attempted casting value of will result in a miscast. So as you can see there, it looks really, really awesome as well. That's the reason why you take the Saigors. They're perfect anti-magic uh, creatures. So that part is actually kind of cool there too. And then of course we have the Jabber Slythe. Those are back as well. And from what I'm seeing here, it looks like it's relatively remained the same. This is the last time we saw these things as well. Um, looks like they no longer fly though. Looks like the only thing they have now is hover. So it looks like they took away their fly rule and only give them hover instead. Which is kind of sad, but you know, them's the breaks I guess. But as you can see there, we got their Aura of Madness ability. We got their Slithy Tongue as well, as well as their different upgrades. So that part is pretty cool as well. And then we have a brand new monster now in the army list that is called a Hag Tree. It's got movement 5, weapon skill 3, 5 strength, 6 toughness, 5 wounds, 2 initiative, and it's attacks, random attacks, at d6 plus 2 attacks. It's flammable, it's got the forest strider, immunity, psychology, natural armor 3 up, as well as stubborn rules. And it says for virtual rules we have constant wailing, enemy units within 6 inches, suffering minus 1 to the leadership. This has no effect on units with immunity psychology special rule. We have the flailing appendages, a hag tree counts having no flanks or rear for the purposes of combat resolution. And then we have regenerative snacking. <laughs> it's actually a pretty cool name. Uh, for every model killed in close combat by the hag tree, roll a d6 on a 6 up. The hag tree regains one wound previously lost in battle. So now we have our new, brand new monsters for that one as well. And we could also include manticores in this army list as well. Now, manticores cannot be taken as mounts in this army, which is kind of sad because I could see a beast lord of some sort, you know, jumping on the back of a manticore or whatever, but that's okay though. You can still include them as a monster. Um, five weapon skill, five strength and toughness, four wounds, five initiative, four attacks, leadership five. They have fly frenzy as well as killing blow. And they can get rending fangs, which give them armor piercing one, blood rage, which gives them a hatred special rule, iron hard skin, which gives them a like four up armor save, and venom tail, which they get an additional poison attack so that part's kind of new cool as well and of course we have chaos giants uh chaos giants make a return once again uh for these guys they relatively stay the same the only difference though now is that you get a new upgrade called mutant monstrosity that you can pay for and that gives them a five up armor save which is actually kind of nice to see that uh, getting an armor save for those guys as well and then of course our last unit as well as a brand new addition to this book we have ram horns now i'm not sure if ram horns were in previous editions of the rule sets, but let's go ahead and talk about this real quick. So it is a monster, it's got a weapon a movement at eight, weapon skill of three, six strength, toughness wounds, one initiative, five attacks, and a six level leadership. It has the frenzy, impact hits of D6 plus two, plus four natural armor. It's also got the thunderous charge ability, and they also have the stubborn special rule, and of course they have Bessigors as well as well. The Ramhorn in this case can act like a kind of like a monster with the riders on the back. They have little how does on it from according from the army list we'll be seeing. So you can have Bessigor crew on there as well, and at the same time, you could also mount a character on one of these things as well, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, really gives you a powerful mount for your uh, generals or for your wizards, which would be actually kind of cool as well. So now that we're done talking about the different army units as well as army lists, the next thing we're going to talk about now are the special characters. All right, so now we're going to talk about the special character. So once again, Gorthor the Cruel, he makes a return as well. This is the special character. As you can see, he still has pretty much the similar stats as well. Now, I'm not overly familiar with the characters, special character for Beastmen. I never really played Beastmen myself or fought them many times either, so I'm not sure if there's any significant changes with this rules, but we'll just go over a, a brief little uh, overview for each of the characters. So that way you can see what they're capable of. We have this Favorite or Chaos ability, which means he may reroll Psychology and Break Tests. He also must be the Army General when that happens. We have Bregar, uh, Bregar the Tamer, and basically reroll any Fleeing and Pursuit Distance rolls. And even though originally he came with a Chariot, you don't automatically get that anymore. You actually have to pay for the Chariot in order for this character to be on there. And we'll talk about that when we get to the Army lists. We also have Sign of the Gods, which means that at the start of each friendly magic phase, randomly generate a spell from the lore of death. Gorthur may use this spell during the magic phase as a bound spell with a power level equal to half the casting value of the spell rounding up. 
Gorther may not exchange the result for the first spell from the same lore as a wizard normally would. So, that's actually pretty cool from that. We also have his weapon, tragic weapons, the Impaler, cause D3 multiple wounds. And if Gorthor rolls any doubles or triples of successful rolls to hit, these attacks automatically wound. So pretty cool there. We have the Skull of Mugrar. It's for his chariots, and basically you may re-roll extra dice when you re-roll for, uh, for your impact hits, and the highest result may be chosen. In addition, this gives Gorthor the immunity of multiple wounds special rule. And then we have the Cloak of the Beast Lord, which basically means he gets a ward, of, a ward save equal to the strength that hits him. So that's actually kind of interesting as well. Then we have Kazrak with a one eye. This is the ambushing special character, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, it looks like he's got his Red Maw Chaos Hound that he can include with him as well. He has his Bestial Cunning, which means all units using the Ambusher special rule in the same army as Kazrak may choose to reroll the dice to see when they enter play. We have Packmaster, which gives all Warhounds plus one leadership and the Ambusher special rule. He still has Scourge, his magic weapon, as well as his Dark Mail. This actually makes him pretty good on one-on-one -on -one combat against characters whenever he's in a challenge, so that's pretty neat as well. We have Morgur, the Shadow Grave, Master of Skulls. So we have this character again. This is that mutant uh, character that caused all kinds of mutations. Uh, looks like he's got his Random Movement 2D6 rule, which is kind of weird because it looks like he has Movement 5 up here, so I'm not sure if that's a mistake or not, but... Anyways, he's also unbreakable. He's got his four strider rule. He's got primal fury as well. A beastman army containing Margura must reroll all successful unruly tests. Which makes sense because he's all about mutations. We have the beast roar. All from the beastman models within 12 inches may reroll rally tests. We also have the taint. If Margura is in 12 inches of force, all enemy units, even partially within that force, suffer minus one to their leadership. We have aura transmutation. Margura cannot be harmed in any way by missile attacks or spells. Oh, very cool. Unless the model, which is in the source of the attack, is in 12 inches of him. Furthermore, at the beginning of each round of close combat, all enemy models in base contact take a strength 3 hit with no armor save allowed. We also have the Spirit Essence of Chaos. At the beginning of your magic phase, all units within 8 inches of Margura must pass a leadership test or suffer d6 strength 4 hits, which ignores armor save. If one or more wounds are inflicted, you may place a Chaos Spawn within 3 inches of the vacated spot, provided there is space and you have the appropriate model available. When the spawn appears, it must be placed more than one inch away from other models. Oof, that's really, really scary as well. So it looks like you can generate up to six spawn in a single game if you're actually pretty lucky on that. Very devastating. Then we have uh, Skull Weave. His enchanted item causes terror. Any model attempting to attack in close combat must suffer a minus one to hit. And then we have the Bray Staff of Morgur and the Stones of the Skull Cave. It says, if a, any wizard, friend or foe within 12 inches, rolls a six, are rolling on the miscast table, then the unfortunate wizard is instantly turned into a chaos spawn under the control of the beastman player, and the rolled result on the miscast table is ignored. The spawn has as many wounds as the wizard did when he miscasts. If you do not have a spawn model to replace the wizard, they simply count as slain. If the wizards within an army unit follow the same rules described under the spirit essence of chaos above, this newly created unit does not award victory points. In addition, Morgur generates two dispel dice to be added to the beastman player's disc by a pool. Oh, very powerful ability there too, so very destructive. Then we have Malagor, the Dark Omen, the Crowfather, the Spoiler, the Sacred Harbinger of Disaster. I love these titles that these guys have, which is actually kind of cool. So this guy looks like he's a wizard who strength 4, toughness 5, and 2 attacks. Looks like he's a level 4 wizard from the Lore of Beasts, Shadow, Lore of Death, or the Lore of the Wild. Looks like he can fly too, so that's pretty cool. It says, something quick this way come, enemy units within 6 inches may not use their general's inspiring presence rule. Unholy power, Malagor has a dread agenda given on to him by the dark gods themselves, and every spell Malagor casts brings his unholy mission that much closer to fruition. For every spell Malagor casts that is not dispelled, he gets a cumulative plus one on subsequent casting attempts for the rest of the magic phase. Pretty dangerous. And he's also got Icon of Vilification. All enemies within all friendly units of the six inches Malagor may be rolled failed primal fairy tests. Wow, pretty cool. So very deadly there. Then we have Torox, the Brass Bull, the Slaughterborn Blood Beast, the Brazen One. If I remember correctly, this guy is the full metal um, um, Minotaur, I think is what he was. Uh, let's see here. Looks like he's got Frenzy, Impact Hits, got a D3 plus one. He's got Slaughter's Call. He has Brass Body. He has a one up armor save. However, if an attack rolls a 6 to hit and then a 6 to wound, then Torox will be slain outright if he fails his saving throw. Wow, pretty interesting there. And then we have Rune Tortured Axes. As his two hand weapons, attacks these weapons have a no armor save and flaming attacks special rule. Oh, very cool. 
Then we have Goro's Warhoof, the Sire of a Thousand Young. This is the guy who's like a centigore, if I remember correctly. He's got his, yeah. He's got the Sons of Goro. Skoros may be deployed with a unit of centigores and may not leave it. His centigore unit is comprised of his most able sons as plus one weapon skill. Such is the kin's devotion that Goros can always use the lookout sir role, provided there is at least one other centigore in this unit if he's still alive. And then we have the Father of Beasts special rule. Should Goros be killed, all beast minions in the army receive plus one bonus to the leadership when taking primal fury tests. He's got his Man Smasher weapon, which gives him D3 multiple wounds, and he's also got the skull of the Unicorn Lord. Oh, that's tragic. He killed a unicorn? Alright, it says the skull gives Koros magic to resistance. However, such is the desire to avenge the Unicorn Lord that all units in the Warhammer Wood Elves have the hatred special rule against Goros and his unit. Oh man, that's so sad. He killed a unicorn. Okay, <laughs> cool. Then we have Moloch Slug Ton. The Famine Feed. The Barren One. Lord of the Black Harvest. <laughs> It's actually very cool. Very narrative, really cool, these, these titles that these guys have, which is actually kind of cool. Looks like he's a level 2 wizard. Looks like he's a hero level caster with Lord of Death or Lord of the Wild. He's got poison attacks as well for region save. He's got the Curse of the Famine Feed. At the start of each of your turns, all enemy units within 18 inches of Slug Tongue must pass D3 Toughness Test or suffer a wound which ignores armor saves for every failed toughness test. Hmm. Interesting. And then we have Moonclaw, son of Morslieb, the lunatic prince, child of the Gravid Orb. Uh, looks like he's a hero level character as well. Level 1 wizard, uses Lore of Shadow or Lore of the Wild. He's got match resistance 2 and a 5 of ward save. Interesting. And he looks like he's a cavalry character of some sort. So it looks like he rides a monster. What is this? A two-headed beast named Umbralok. Hmm. Interesting there. That's kind of cool. Like, actually kind of neat kind of putting this together real quick if you want to convert this miniature. Um, continuing on, it says, a wave of insanity. Every enemy unit within 12 inches of Moonclaw must take a stupidity test at the start of their turn. An unholy zenith. At the beginning of the game, secretly roll a d3 and record the number. And the turn that corresponds to this number, more sleeve is full. For the entire duration of that turn, Moonclaw has a 2 up bonus in his casting abilities. Furthermore, to represent his ability to call down a shower of Warpstone Meteors, he may make D3 shooting attacks resolved as if it were a stone thrower for that turn only, even if he moved or marched in the movement phase. And a result of a misfire causes a single wound upon one claw that cannot be saved by any means. Oh, very cool. So this guy looks like he can cause some major problems with you, especially if he wants to do some long range shooting. Now, the only problem, of course, you got to use the stone thrower rules, but still, very, very cool. Then we have Ungrowl Fourhorn, the Black Heart Horns Thief, the Spurn One. Okay, I think I heard this guy. He's like the uh, Ungor special character, I think is what he is. So pretty mediocre stats. Uh, looks like he's got Bruised and Bitter. Ungrowl must deploy with a unit of Ungors and may never leave it. Ungrowl and his unit may reroll failed Primal Fury tests when in combat against units of Empire, Bretonian, and Beastman army books. However, Ungrol's unit may not use the army general's leadership and no other characters may join the unit. <laughs> so it looks like he's bitter as well. And then we have the Stolen Crowns. Take a leadership test for Ungrol at the beginning of each of his turns. If passed, he gains plus two weapon skill and plus one strength. Well, that's actually pretty good. Until the start of his next turn. If he fails, he is treated as a level one wizard instead. Randomly generate a spell from the Lord of the Wild each time. Oh, so that's actually pretty good. Not bad. Uh, depending on what his point value is, he actually might just be pretty good to carry around just to create that kind of spamming uh, stuff right there. That's actually kind of cool. All right. And that pretty much finishes up our special characters. So now we're going to talk about magic as well as magic items next. Okay, so now we're back with the lore of the wild, which is the magic uh, that they use for their lore for the beastmen. It uh, looks like for the lore attribute we have Primal Onslaught. It says a spell from the lore of wilds is cast all from the units with the Primal special Fury special rule. Within six inches may roll an additional dice for their Primal Fury tests in the ensuing close combat phase and discard the highest dice. So, very powerful ability there, especially that we can get your rerolls as well as your additional attacks if you want to get the Frenzy, which is kind of cool. So for our signature spell, which all wizards automatically know, we have the Bestial Surge. It's a cast about a 7-up. It is an augment spell that targets all non-fleeing friendly units within 6 inches. If cast, all units will immediately make a move straight forward following the rules for random movement. D6 plus 1. The wizard can choose to instead have their spell target all friendly units within 12 inches. If they do so, the casting value is increased to 14. So, pretty important because, um, you know, beasts need to get engaged in close combat as quickly as possible, so... That could actually really help them out. Then we have Vile Tide, our level 1 spell, casting a 5 up. 
Magic Missile, the range of 24 inches, that inflicts D6 strength 1 hits. The wizard can then choose to extend the range of the spell to 40 inches. If they do so, the casting values increase to 8 plus. So, strength 1 hits. Very interesting. Then we have Devolve, which is cast on a, it's a level 2 spell, cast on an 8 plus. It says it's a hex spell that targets all enemy units within 12 inches. All target units must take a leadership test. If the test is failed, the unit suffers a number of wounds equal to the amount of the test was failed by with the Ignore's Armor Save special rule. The wizard can choose to extend to have their spell target all enemy units within 24 inches. If they do so, the casting value is increased to 16 plus. Oof. This could be really deadly against horde-based armies like orcs and goblins, for example, or armies of low leadership. This could really mess them up if you're not careful. Then we have level 3 spell Bray Scream, which is at 8 plus, is a direct damage spell. The caster makes a breath weapon attack at strength 4. This may be cast in close combat, following the normal rules for breath weapons. The wizard can choose to instead have the spell be resolved at strength 5. If they do so, the casting value is increased to strength uh, to plus 13. Oh, that's a really cool ability to have, especially since a lot of your Bray Shamans have no problem engaging in close combat, so that's pretty crazy. <laughs> Then we have uh, Traitorkin. No, oh, I heard of this spell. I heard about this spell on a commander on a, on a Lord Tremendous battle report. Cast on a 10 plus. It's a hex spell that targets all enemy cavalry, monstrous cavalry, chariots, ridden monsters, as well as war beasts, with the mixed unit special rule within 12 inches. All affected models will suffer a number of hits equal to the attack's characteristics of their mounts, using their strength. And in the case of a mixed unit. Only the handlers are targeted and by only by models in base contact. Any armor save bonuses from the Beast Natural Armor Burning Citra have no effect. <laughs> yeah, you could actually have it to where your own monster eats your own character, which is actually kind of cool. So then level 5 spell is Mantle of Gorok. It is a cast on a 10 plus. Mantle of Gorok is an augment spell with a range of 12 inches that can be cast on a friendly character, including the wizard itself. The model gains plus D6 strength and D6 attacks, both to a maximum of 10 until the start of the caster's next magic phase. Additionally, if one or more sixes are rolled, the model suffers a strength five hit with no saves of any kind possible. Ooh, kind of a risk benefit thing, which is actually kind of cool to use, especially if you're going like on a suicide charge with one of your characters or with your uh, or with your shaman, which is actually kind of cool. And then level six, we have Savage Dominion, cast on a 15 plus, augment spell that's cast on the wizard itself. The wizard may summon one of the following monsters, a Gorgon, a Jabber Slyth, or Chaos Giant. Immediately place a model representing this beast with its base touching any table edge. This model is effectively part of the Beastman army from the moment on. Every time the beast suffers a wound, the wizard that summons it must take a toughness test. If it is failed, the wizard takes a wound too, with no saves of any kind possible. If the wizard is killed, the beast wanders back into the forest and is immediately removed from play. And note that the battle beast cannot be voluntarily dismissed by the wizard or dispelled by enemy in falling rounds. In addition, only one monster may be summoned by the same wizard at any same time. Wow, that's actually a pretty powerful ability right there too. And especially if it's, you know, it is kind of bad in the sense that your wizard could be killed that way because this monster takes wounds, but at the same time though, getting a free monster really can't beat that. So let's go on to the, uh, we also go so hard at the Laura's niche. We can use that as well as Laura of Nurgle and Laura of Slanesh. I'm not going to go too far into those just because I'm going to cover those in our Warriors of Chaos uh, rules. So I'm, like, I'm just going to skip over those for now. Now it looks like we have our Gifts of Chaos. It looks like these guys have these again. So we have our Crown of Horns, which is worth 35 points. The General can only have this. The Bearer of the Crown of Horns gains a Warp State of 5 up. In addition, any unit joins gains plus 1 any rally attempts they make. We have Mini Limbed Fiend giving them plus one attack for 15 points. Gnarled Hide gives you a five up armor save with 15 points. Slug Skin, all enemy units in base contact with the model at the start of any close combat suffers a strength two hit with poison attack special rule on a 10 up. It looks like we have Gore Tusk gives you armor piercing one for 10 points. Rune of the True Beast gives you 10 points. War beasts, swarms, as well as any mounts are not allowed to target the model bearing the rune of the true beast in close combat that any riders may attack as normal. Hmm. We have Uncanny Senses, gives you a plus one initiative for five points. A Shadow Hide, which is a model on foot only. Enemy models target the character with missile attacks over minus one to hit modifier for five points. That's actually not bad for five points. And then of course we have our magical items, Spoils of the Hearthstones. So I know in the sixth edition of the Beastman rules, there are a lot more magic items. So I just will tell you guys that their magic items have been severely limited. There is not nearly as many as they used to be. 
So let's go ahead and talk about those cool. So we have the Axes of Korgor, which is worth 60 points. Uh, two hand weapons. The bear may reroll all fell wound rolls to wound and to hit in close combat. In addition, he gets armor piercing to one special roll. So pretty modest ability for 60 points. You know, for 60 points, you think you get something a little bit more. Then we have the Black Maw for 50 points. The Black Maw adds plus two to the bearer's strength and gives him the Frenzy special roll. In addition, the weapon ignores any rules that would otherwise destroy the weapon. Mm, kind of a modest ability for 50 points as well, in my opinion. Then we have the Stone Crusher Mace for 35. It's a great weapon. The mace always wounds on a 2+. plus. Armor saves are taken using the wielder's normal strength. Against buildings, chariots, shrines, and war machines, the wielder has a multiple wounds d6 characteristic. That one's actually kind of dependent on that one. It's not bad for 35 points, but you know it's very dependent on that part. And then we have Great Fang, which is worth 35 points. The wielder of Great Fang gains a plus one to wound, and enemies must roll successful armor saves. Once again, kind of a modest ability for a magic weapon. Then we have the fur of Shargu, which is worth 40 points, magic armor. This fur gives a wearer a 4-up armor save against missile attacks, as well as a 5 award save. Well, kind of interesting. We have the Ramhorn Helm, a 6-up armor save. For every armor save the wearer passes, the bearer may immediately make a bonus attack at his space strength. So that one's always been a cool one that we have here for 15 points. That's always been a cool little magic item they have. Chalice of Dark Rain. It's an arcane item for 35 points, one use only. At the beginning of the enemy's shooting phase, the bearer can summon a storm of mud and worms with which to blind his enemies. For the rest of the phase, all enemy missile units are at a minus one to hit. Weapons or attacks that do not use ballistic skill may only fire on a roll of a four plus. This one is actually pretty good for the point value, in my opinion. Um, one of the main problems that beastmen have always had is that they get shot to pieces as they cross the battlefield. This could actually buy you a turn without having to worry about being shot at. And if you're actually really lucky, you can actually close a distance within two turns, maybe three, if you're lucky with this one. This could actually help you out as you're crossing the battlefield. Very cool. I can see a lot of beastmen players using this one. Then we have the Shard of the Herdstone for 50 points. It's an arcade item. It says, after deployment zones have been agreed, but before armies have been deployed, place an appropriate terrain piece to represent the herdstone in your deployment zone, no more than three inches in diameter. At the start of your magic phase, each friendly brave shaman or great brave shaman that six into this herdstone generates an additional power dice. Eesh. I don't know about this one. Uh, 50 points is pretty steep for an arcane item like that, and since if you're a beastman, you're not really staying in your deployment zone too much, you're pretty much just heading out from your deployment zone, no matter what the situation may be. So you're never going to be really within range of this thing to get any of the benefits of it, in, in my opinion. Not for 50 points anyways. Maybe if you could just put it anywhere on the battlefield, I could see it being that powerful. Like, like if you could just put it anywhere on the battlefield you wanted to, that could be really nice because then that way with your range of the Hearthstone, you can use your abilities. But if it's stuck in your deployment zone though, I really don't see how that could be really advantageous for you, especially since Beastmen do not play defensively, they're always on the offense. I'd probably skip this one if I was you. Um, then we have the Dark Heart, which is 35 point, uh, 30 points, a chanted item. The character in any unit led by him adds plus D3 to their charge move. Roll after declaring charges. If the charges fail, the models move their normal failed charge distance. This one might be pretty good. I can see you using that a little bit, but for 30 points, that was kind of steep for that D3 adding it. And then of course we have the Beast Manor, which is the gold standard, where 60 points, the bear and any he has joined has plus one bonus to their strength. So yeah. That's a still must-have item. That thing is absolutely awesome to use, especially if you're using a Bessigore unit. So there you guys have it. That makes up the magic items, as well as magic for the Beastmen. Next thing we're going to finish up with is talking about the Beastmen army list. All right, so the very last thing we're going to talk about in this army review real quick is the army list. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. So like I said before, for your lord choices, like for Gorthor the Beast Lord, a lot of your amount options for characters are not automatically given. Now there's some good and bad things about that. For one, it does make your characters much more expensive since they gotta pay for their mounts as well. But at the same time, it also allows you a lot of flexibility in my opinion. So just to pretend you just want Gorthor just by himself and you want him to be inside of a unit because you want him to be protected by other infantry forces, you're not restricted to just taking him out all the time. You could actually just have him be inside of a unit, which can be pretty beneficial since he can't be targeted by War Machines as easily. So that's an example that actually kind of works out for it. So he's worth 300 points. Kazrak the One-Eyed, uh, you have to pay for him Red Maul. He costs 15 points as well. So you can see a lot of these characters are 300 plus points for the special characters. 
Uh, your Beast Lord is 145 points. He has a several mount options you can take. As you can see here, you can also r ride a ram horn, like I talked about earlier, which is really cool as well. And same thing with your Great Bray Shaman. I can see that being a very powerful option for your Wizard Lords to ride a ram horn. That would actually be kind of cool to give him kind of like a little bit more survivability as well. Then of course you have your Doom Bull, which is always popular for 235 points as well. Can take marks, uh, can get equipped medium armor for 5 points, which gives a 5 up armor save. You can have your gifts and your magic lives worth 100 points. And then you have your hero characters, uh, Moloch's Lugton and Goro's Warhoof, for example. Moonclaw, Son of Morsleep, he's worth 200 points. That actually is pretty decent considering the things you can do overall for your army, so that's not actually not so bad. And on Girl, four horns only worth 70 points too. It actually might be worth it just to take him too, just to cause some spamming some problems with your Ungor, so that'd be kind of cool there as well. So you have your Wargore, costs 25 points for him to be a battle standard bearer. You may take additional magic items of 25 points, which is a nice upgrade as well. So as you can see, you can have these uh, different uh, stats for him. Same thing with your Bray Shaman as well, as well as your Gore Bulls, which are your hero level. Um, Minotaurs. It looks like they can't be made into battle standard bearers. I'm not sure if they could before or not. I think you could make your Gorbul into a battle standard bearer, I think. I have to look back on it, but I'm not sure if that was an option or not, but still, we have that right there. So let's go ahead and talk about your core units real quick. So as you see your Gores, they may have additional hand weapons for free. They may be armor throwing axes, so that way they can do some counter shooting if they get counter charge, which would be actually kind of nice as well. And they can also be upgraded to skirmishers for free, which is really, really cool as well. So that part's kind of neat. And then, of course, you have your Ungors, uh, armed with spears, cost one point of model for those guys. Your Ungor Raiders, uh, maybe equipped with javelins instead of short bows, which is kind of nice so that we get that extra hift with the uh, attack they do. And these are the mutants we were talking about earlier as well. They can only cost three points per model, so that's actually really cool there too. You can have a huge horde of spammable uh, mutants with some abilities if you want to use those guys as kind of like flak. Then we have our Tuscord Chariots for 80 points as well. And it looks like we have our Chaos Warhounds here. Looks like you can upgrade them with Poison Attacks as well as Natural Armor for a point apiece. Very modest, actually. That's actually pretty good for those guys. That's pretty good. And then moving on to our Special Unit. So like, like I talked about before, the best of cards actually have a little bit of a difference now with their points. They cost 11 points per model, but they automatically come with Shield, Light Armor, and Hand Weapons. They no longer come with halberds or great weapons or heavy armor as base anymore. You actually have to pay for those. So for example, um, they can still take 50 points with the magic standards. You can equip the medium armor giving a 5 up armor save for 1 point per miniature as well. And now you can actually either give them additional hand weapons if you want to take on lighter choices. Great weapons which give the 2 up strength for the first round of combat and plus 1 strength for every round afterwards. Or halberds. So once again, they can take halberds again which is worth 1 point apiece which is really nice. Plus they can also take marks which has always been cool as well. And of course you have your Minotaurs as well. Minotaurs of course still have all their abilities so they're doing pretty good there. Um, then you have your Centigors. They can also be equipped with throwing axes too which is pretty cool. And they can also replace their spears with great weapons now so that's pretty cool as well. So they can become really heavy hard hitting if you if you if you equip them out that way. And then continue with their special choices are Razor Gore, Razor Gore Chariots, they're still there as well. Harpies are a special choice worth 11 points apiece. Your Chaos Trolls are worth 40 points apiece now. And they can actually take Light Armor. I'm not sure if that was actually a, an ability for them, but they can take Armor now, which is actually kind of interesting. So it gives them like, what, a 5-up Armor save when combined with their Natural Armor? So it's actually pretty good there. Um, of course, your Chaos Spawn costs 40 points. They're also special now. And then, of course, you have your Praetin and Cockatrices, which are also... Oh, actually, that's not a bad point right there. 80 points and 95 points. That's actually not bad uh, for those guys. You can actually rock a couple of these guys and kind of use them as war machines for your army if you really wanted to. So that's actually pretty cool there, too. So now onto our rare choices. So we have Dragon Ogres and Dragon Shagoths. Um, you can only take one unit of Dragon Ogres and one Dragon Shagoth because of the rare of the army composition rules for this new 9th edition. Uh, you can't have duplicate rare choices unless you play at 3,000 points, which I disagree with, but that's just my personal opinion, just because I don't like people eliminating my choices. Then you have, of course, Gorgons and Cygors. They cost 225 and 108 points apiece. And then now, of course, we talked about earlier, your Manicors. You can include those guys as well for 150 points. And it looks like you can get them out pretty good, too. It looks like for, what, uh, 57 points? So that's, what, 207 points if you want to actually have a fully kitted out Manicor. It's actually pretty good, especially if you want to like, you know, use them for flanking or, or for harassing war machines and that kind of thing. Then of course we have our Jabber Slides. Those guys cost 175 points. 
Uh, what is it? 35 points if you want to get all the upgrades. That makes it what? 210 points for a fully kitted out one. Then we have our Chaos Giant, 212 points if you want to give him the 5 up armor save, which could be really bad, uh, which would be really good for you. And then 200 points for the Hag Tree, and the Ram Horn looks like it's at 225 points. So there you guys have it. That is the army list that we have for the Beastmen for 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy. All right, you guys, so there you have it. This is our review for the 9th edition rules for Warhammer Fantasy Beastman Army book, and my overall impression that this is an excellent resource. It's actually kind of nice to see this rule setting, especially since Beastman really haven't gotten any rule updates um, since the 6th edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. In my opinion, opinion, these 9th edition rules actually make them very viable and very competitive. What I really like about this booklet, though, is the vast variety of choices you actually get. Um, Beastman actually had a very limited amount of choices they could actually put in their armies, so that part was kind of sad. But with this new addition that you see here, they have a lot more things they can throw in their toolkit. And what I really like is a lot of the monsters that they get access to as well. Uh, because, you know, Beastman armies are, well, mutants is what they basically are. So you imagine they'd bring out all these wild creatures and mutant creatures from the woods to bring onto the battlefield. So it really kind of adds to the overall narrative as well as the aesthetic for Beastman. Beastmen are supposed to be like these uncontrolled, you know, nature's fury type of creatures, you know, gone dark side. And I really like that effect. I think it really shows now with their army list, with the monsters they can take, as well as the rules that they have, as well as the choices they can use in their army. Very fast moving, hard hitting unit as well. Um, it'd be actually kind of interesting. Before that, before this edition, the only way you can make Beastmen really viable was to use end time rules, where you actually had to make a chaos legion. Uh, combining beastmen as well as warrior chaos as well as demon elements in your army but now beastmen by themselves are just as brutal just by themselves with these new rule sets as well in fact it'll be kind of interesting to see if there's actually any chaos legion rule sets that uh, matthias elias might make for his warhammer armies project so very well done overall so that's my overall impression of the ninth edition rules for beastmen as always please feel free to like comment and or subscribe your guys input is invaluable to us as always also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to our channel. That's good to do for this one, you guys. We'll catch you guys next one. Peace out and stay classy.